Thank you. Please be seated. And uh, thank you for coming out on this beautiful June night. As your bishop, know how grateful I am that you're here and for your concern. What a great blessing all of you are. So I turn now the program back over to Dr. Knight. Thank you, Bishop Quinn. It is my pleasure uh, to introduce our speaker this evening. Teresa Collette is a professor of law at the University of St. Thomas School of Law, where she teaches property, bioethics, and a seminar of human sexuality and the Constitution. At the request of Pope Benedict, she serves as a consultant to the Pontifical Council for the Family. She also serves on two archdiocesan committees, one regarding bioethics and the other concerned with marriage and family. She is director of the Pro-Life Center at the University of St. Thomas and maintains a small legal practice dedicated to assisting public officials, defending laws, protecting the unborn and the vulnerable. She has represented the governors of Minnesota and South Dakota and served as Special Attorney General for Oklahoma and Kansas. Tonight she's going to address religious liberty in health care. Please welcome Professor Teresa Palau. I'm truly grateful that you've given me this beautiful evening to come and talk about this really important issue. To sort of adjust my remarks to my audience, could I see a show of hands of the physicians in the room? Okay, and other healthcare professionals. All right, so we have just some interested lay people as well. So while it may not have the level of detail that if I were consulting legally with a physician that I would give, it will certainly be understandable to all and give you sufficient detail to know what questions you should ask in the future. So, let me begin with my agenda. First, does the church have a right to speak about health care policy in the public square? That's a challenge that we often encounter when people say, keep it in your churches. Second, has religious liberty been reduced by recent changes in health care policy and law? And under that, I want to talk specifically about two examples, I believe, that prove it has been reduced. First, how does the law protect a provider's conscience? And then second, the HHS mandate, which has been in the news a great deal. And then finally, do our teachings on sexual morality, which much of the conflict boils down to, contradict common sense and good public policy? It might not surprise you to know in advance that my answer is no. <laughs> so, does the church have a right to speak in the public square? It's certainly something that, as active and prayerful Catholics, we do regularly. The photograph in this slide is from National Right to Life, the, the march that we have every January in Washington, D.C., a march that is people increasingly by younger and younger people, I'm encouraged to tell you. In fact, recently, the head of NARAL, the National Abortion Rights Action League, stepped down saying that her movement was aging while our movement was getting younger and younger, and so she was a little worried and needed a younger replacement. I hope they have trouble. <laughs> So let's talk about the fundamental question, do we as Catholics, as Christians, as faithful people, have a right to speak about those convictions in the public square? The image you see on this particular slide of a stained glass window is a stained glass window that you will not find in any church in the country. Or if you do, it's a replica of the original stained glass window, which you find in the United States Capitol, not a church. And on that beautiful stained glass window, you see our first president and the main general of the Revolutionary War, or certainly the leading general of the Revolutionary War, George Washington kneeling in prayer, a practice he had before every anticipated battle. And he followed it more fervently when he hadn't anticipated the battle. <laughs> he was a great man of prayer. We know that from his personal letters. We know that from diaries of contemporaries. We know that from a number of sources. 
And the verse that the artist chose to exemplify our first president is, Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. Which echoes, of course, our national motto, In God we trust. What's important to know about this particular image and its symbolic message is that our founding fathers understood a principle that, frankly, the French, with the French Revolution, did not understand. And it's very simple. First, freedom requires morality. If people are not a moral people, they must be governed by the sword. It's very simple. If they will not be governed by their own conscience, public peace is impossible, absent a policeman on every court. If the rule is a rule of the strongest, as opposed to those who are living in right conduct, we must extend the power of the state in order to preserve the public peace. So our founding fathers were deeply convinced that freedom requires morality. And the next step is, and morality requires religion. Our founding fathers were absolutely confident of that principle. Why? Because morality comes from what St. Paul calls the law that is written on our hearts. It is the natural law that is discernible by reason and is amplified by scripture. Religion helps us understand more deeply and more clearly the natural law that is written on our hearts. And therefore, whether we're talking about Thomas Jefferson, the deist, or George Washington, the Christian, they were united in their understanding <coughs> that freedom requires morality, and morality requires religion. And the final step, religion requires freedom. Because faith and acts on faith cannot be coerced. They must be the product of the free person seeking the nature of the good and seeking to serve it. And so when I talk to my students in constitutional law and in constitutional litigation, I tell them, remember this formula. Freedom requires morality, and morality requires religion, and religion requires freedom. And if you remember that, you will understand the three-legged stool upon which the republic was built. But, if you seek to diminish any one of those three, if you disregard public and personal morality, if you disregard the real role that religion has in creating a society of peace, you will necessarily find a severe reduction in freedom. So as Americans, our founding fathers believed that religion was so important that it is the very first freedom. As our bishops told us in their letter, our most cherished liberty. It is the first freedom in the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights. Not speech, not press, but religion. So the idea that people of faith cannot speak in the public square about the common good is not only wrong-headed, dare I say, it's un-American. It certainly contradicts our history and our foundational documents, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States. So do not be silenced by those who say we have no right to bring our faith into the public square. The three columns upon which the Republic rests, freedom, morality, religion, diminish any, you diminish them all. The question of Health care and religious liberty is simply not a new question. The role of conscience in health care has been debated since the 2500, 2,500 years ago. The Hippocratic Oath, which I am sad to report is no longer taken by a majority of our new minted doctors, provided I will neither give a deadly drug to anyone if asked for it, a prohibition against assisted suicide, nor will I make a suggestion to this effect. Similarly, I will not give a woman an abortive remedy. 
Well, in our politically correct age, you can see how this certainly is unacceptable to require our young doctors to take this up. And so fewer and fewer med schools make it a part of the graduation ceremony. The last statistic I saw, which is not recent, was 17% of all med school grads recite the Hippocratic Oath. So it's a debate. What is the role of morality and religion in the provision of healthcare services? Has religious liberty been reduced by recent changes in healthcare policy and law? Well, according to a 2009 survey of faith-based pro professionals by the Christian Medical and Dental Association, 95% of faith-based physicians agreed I would rather stop practicing med med medicine altogether than to be forced to violate my conscience. Now at one level, I find that a great comfort because it means my doctor will be someone who will fight to preserve the right to care for me in accordance with their conscience. 32% of faith-based healthcare professionals reported having, quote, been pre pressured to refer a patient for a procedure to which they had moral, ethical, or religious objections. 39% of faith-based healthcare professionals have, quote, experienced pressure from or discrimination by faculty or administrators based on their moral, ethical, or religious beliefs. 20% of faith-based medical students say they are not pursuing a career in obstetrics or gynecology because of perceived discrimination and coercion in that field. This was a telephone survey, I'm sorry, this was a computer survey of over 1,800 healthcare professions. So certainly, at least within the professions, they feel a growing encroachment on their ability to practice law in accord with their conscience. Now, the United States has a long history of protecting physicians in particular, but some of the newer the Holy Spirit may be calling. I best turn it, answer it, and then turn it off. <laughs> it's not. All right. <laughs> I apologize. So we've had a long history of statutorily protecting physicians' consciences, and then more recently, a broader definition of healthcare providers. What laws in the federal level protect? a healthcare provider's right to not be involved, at least insofar as we're talking about abortion and sterilization, the Church Amendment, the Public Health Services Act, Medicare and Medicaid have specific regulations on this point. 42 U.S.C. 238 N is a provision that protects the rights of physicians to provide care in accordance with their conscience. And then, of course, the Weldon Amendment. Now, why were these statutes even proposed, more or less passed? Well, in the 1960s, the federal courts began to believe that health care providers were similar to a public utility, that they should provide services upon demand because informed consent meant that it was the patient who directed what should occur in any instance and that a health care <coughs> provider, in order to ensure access, should not decline to provide whatever the requested services were. Montana was the first federal court that said to a Catholic hospital that they could not maintain their policy of declining use of their facilities for voluntary sterilizations. When members of Congress heard of this ridiculous interpretation of Medicare and Medicaid legislation, they acted swiftly. And as each new outrage came, they enacted statutes to checkmate courts who sought to coerce health care providers to provide whatever service a patient might demand that's not illegal. So the Congress has not been negligent in this area generally. 
although that has changed significantly in the past 10 to 15 years. But because of these particular statutory protections, the question became, well, if you are experiencing coercion, if you are being discriminated against for your refusal to provide particularly morally objectionable services, what do you do and how can it be enforced? So in 2008, in the final days of the last presidential administration, Secretary Levitt, who was the Secretary of Health and Human Services prior to Secretary Sebelius, promulgated a conscience policy. And in that conscience policy, it was made illegal, which it already was in statutes, but as an administrative rule, to discriminate in employment, promotion, termination, or the extension of staff or other privileges to any physician, and here's an important part, or other healthcare professional, so it's much broader in scope as to who it protects. For instance, it would protect my daughter, who just graduated this May from John Hopkins in nursing, not simply limited to physicians, because he performed, assisted in the performance, refused to perform, or refused to assist in the performance of any lawful health service, which unfortunately today is understood to include abortion, or research activity, and this is an innovation because it protects researchers and being in the home of Mayo, an important innovation, or research activity on the grounds that his performance or assistance in performance of such service or activity would be contrary to his moral beliefs or religious beliefs or moral convictions or because of the religious beliefs or moral convictions concerning such activities themselves. So specifically, assist in the performance was broadened to include any medical act, including a broad range of actions linked to the controverted act. So not only the, the physician who is unwilling to perform the abortion, but the nursing assistant who is being asked to prepare the instrument for it, or even the admissions clerk who is being asked to admit. Any medical act including a broad range of actions linked to the controverted act. So the Levitt rule broadens the protection. It includes counseling, referral, training, or other arrangements for the procedure, health service, or research activity. The inclusion of training is of crucial importance because we have seen various professional associations of physicians, like the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, attempt to force a regulation or rule that would require every medical resident seeking to become an obstetrician or gynecologist to undergo training in abortion notwithstanding that a DNC, where the pregnancy has already ended, but there has not been the spontaneous expulsion of the child, notwithstanding that almost all of the technical skills can be learned in those instances through a moral procedure. So the inclusion of training is to checkmate accreditation agencies that would change the nature of medical education and require faithful students in this area to perform immoral acts as a condition of admission into the wonderful profession of nursing or of medicine. So, it, it defined the term healthcare entity to include individual physicians or other healthcare professionals, healthcare personnel, a participant in a program or training in the health profession. That's important because, of course, the first year med student isn't a physician and would not qualify. So the regulation specifically gave students in these programs protection. For example, the University of Baltimore, I'm sorry, the University of Vanderbilt, recently established as a requirement to admission 
to their master's program in nursing that the applicant be willing to assist in the performance of an abortion. Now I'm proud to report that a group of lawyers that I'm associated with that provides pro bono legal services in particular cases were able to persuade the University of Vermont that they did not want to enforce or continue that policy, at least unless they wanted to pay big sums of money to lots of people. So, <laughs> but it's important because the regulation protects not only the student, but the applicant for training or study in the healthcare professions. A postgraduate physician training program, a hospital, a provider service, a uh, sponsored organization, a health maintenance organization. They went about and crafted a very broad definition of who the healthcare entity to be protected by these conscience regulations are. Similarly, in their regulation, they talked about the workforce and they broadly construed it. Workforce means employees, volunteers, trainees, contractors, and other persons whose conduct in the performance of a work for a department funded entity, meaning they're taking government funds, is under the control of authority of such entity, whether or not they are paid by the department funded entity or healthcare providers holding privileges in that entity. This broad definition is particularly important in order to protect researchers who do not want to participate in embryonic stem, research, stem cell research or other morally problematic procedures and studies. So in 2008, at the close of 2008, the Department of Health and Human Services had a very broad protection to almost everyone involved in the healthcare practice. And it covered both religious and objections based on moral conviction and allowed them to opt out or to perform certain services that they found morally necessary. But that changed. <clears throat> Almost immediately after taking office, the new administration withdrew the health care regulations that I was just describing and took three years to formulate a new regulation in order to provide an enforcement mechanism of statutory protections found in the Church Amendment, the Weldon Act, and those other federal statutes that exist to protect physicians and other health care providers. <clears throat> and in their new regulation, they eliminate all of those broad and helpful definitions. Therefore, interpreting these statutes, I'm just going to talk louder and wave your hand if you can't hear me in the back. My kids tell me I can talk very loud. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So it eliminated all of those broad definitions that ensured protection of things like the admission clerk, the EMT, the researcher, the assistant, the lab tech in the research lab. Eliminated all of them, returning to a question of what the statutory scope would be. And therefore, at least implicitly, by the comments, which are not effective as agency rules, but are effective in interpreting those agency rules, essentially restricting it back to those licensed healthcare professionals, i.e. physicians and nurses, or DOs and nurses, and, and not allowing this broader community of those who contribute to providing health care in coverage. It also appears to restrict the procedures that will be covered under conscience protection because the Levitt rule broadened the procedures that would be protected if you object to them. Things like sex, uh, sex change operations. Things like embryonic stem cell. Things that simply were not really <coughs> under consideration when the very first of these statutes began to be passed. Instead, the new regulation eliminates the definition that gives a broadening interpretation of the nature of procedures that can be objected to, 
at least suggesting that all of these procedures, abortion and sterilization in particular, will be subject to a balancing test. And therefore, physicians and healthcare providers in areas where there are a limited number of providers may in fact not be covered by the conscience protection. Finally, they eliminate the procedural rules about how you complain if you are subject to illegal discrimination. Now they do preserve the establishment of an Office of Civil Rights within the Department of Human Services. But they took out the regulation that required that every entity receiving HHS funds and Medicaid and Medicare funds must report on an annual basis that they are in compliance with this. So essentially they shift the burden to an individual who has suffered harm to identify legal counsel and then legal counsel must create their best guess of what procedures should be followed to present a complaint to this civil rights office within HHS. As a lawyer, it's appalling. The one thing you should be able to do is know who you complain to and what the nature of the complaint has to be and what the rules the complaint will be adjudicated under are. And yet, under the new regulation, we have none of that information. It appears that we are no longer operating under the rule of law, but rather under the rule of agency discretion. A far cry from the traditional understanding of the rule of law. So that's the huge shift we've seen in conscience protection. What about the HHS mandate? And why do we, in particular, in union with our bishops, but not just us, Many people of many faiths and many people of no faith, except themselves, oppose the HHS mandate. Well, first, what is it? Again, it's not a statute, and it's really important to understand this. We have no elected official who promulgated this rule. Rather, it comes through an agency which is an executive appointment. Now it is true that Secretary Sebelius had to be approved by, a congr by Congress, but she herself holds office with absolutely no accountability to the voters directly. So, Secretary Sebelius promulgated a rule that requires employers to provide insurance plans that cover contraception, sterilization, and abortion-inducing drugs. And she did so under the guise of specifying or defining what preventative services must be provided for free, a provision that was in the 2000-plus Health Care Act that was passed. So every employer that does not willingly provide coverage for contraception, sterilization, and abortion-induced drugs will be subject to heavy fines. Now, many people who support this innovative understanding of government power say, well, that doesn't really matter. And I will tell you, having been involved in the public debate, to talk about this last point, <coughs> the fines, if you simply say, the church will have to pay heavy fines, you will see a large collective shrug from a large segment of our fellow citizenry. But if you say, the church is going to have to reduce the food available in our food pantries, the church is going to have to eliminate so many beds in our homeless shelter. The church is not going to be open to open that new domestic abuse victims shelter. The church is not going to be able to run <coughs> the adoption services program that we've run because we simply do not have the money. We're giving it to the government instead. 
you get a very different public response. Because while they may not share our faith, and they may not value our God, they value the good that we do in society. So as you discuss this with your fellow citizens, cast it in terms of the great good that the church does and how these fines will simply go into some government coffer to fund the bridge to nowhere, as opposed to adding two more beds in that homeless shelter. The exemption within it is very limited. It applies only to religious employers that employ primarily members of their own faith and serve primarily <laughs> members of its own faith. And yet, it is the tradition of the church, following the example of our Savior, to not condition our care of the sick and the elderly and the vulnerable in our society upon their membership as a Catholic. Even the dogs have a right to the crumbs from the master's table. We see that as a lesson to us that the good we do must be extended to all, that everyone is our neighbor, and that our social services must not be restricted. Essentially, if we are to adopt that definition, we will be retreating in and in and in until eventually we provide no services to anyone outside the walls of the building we stand in today. Organizations such as Catholic hospitals, universities, and homeless shelters simply will not qualify because we do not condition our educational services or our shelter or the health care services that we provide on the basis of relig religious affiliation. And whether an organization is exempt will not be decided by the organization, not by the church, but rather by some government bureaucrat. Now let me pause here. This exemption, in addition to not covering the University of St. Thomas, where I teach, or St. Joseph's Hospital, where my daughter gave birth to our second grandchild five months ago, in addition to not covering those entities, it will not cover any private <coughs> employer who seeks to conduct their worldly affairs in accordance with their teachings regarding the gospel. My husband and I, before I went to law school, owned a small bridal salon that grew into several tuxedo stores. Under this mandate, we would not, is that pregnancy-related treatment to any child of any age does not require parental involvement. And that the physician's determination may well be a situation where the parent is excluded from any knowledge regarding this. This is simply in furtherance of that idea. Well, what about the argument everybody's doing it? This is a favorite of the New York Times. Most Catholics, Christians, practice birth control and don't agree with the church's teaching on sexual morality. Reality? Yeah. There are a lot of Catholics and Christians who struggle with the church's teaching on sexual morality. Wouldn't be surprised if a few of them are in this audience. But the fact that we struggle to conform our conscience, the fact that we may even have not gotten to the point where we could fairly characterize it as struggling, doesn't mean that we disagree and want our church forced to act contrary to their conscience. Polls are very clear that most Americans do not want to force Mother Angelica to hand out the pill. It's very simple. Even though she runs a multimedia organization that's quite successful. Her business success does not cost her her conscience. And heaven help us if it ever does. When you get through all of that thicket of falsehoods, not to be too harsh, you come to the argument, well, what about the president's accommodation? 
Why aren't you Catholics accepting the president's accommodation? The administration has promised and compromised with the church as evidenced by the president's speech. Well, the reality is there never was or has been an accommodation. It's a speech and that's it. The regulations that were finalized by HHS that legally bind all of us should the health care provisions that gave rise to this survive the Supreme Court judgment on Thursday did not change one comma, one period, one word. They are exactly as initially proposed. Nor has there even been a revision of that rule published for public comment. Accommodation? No. Pretty words and nice speech? Yes. But it won't save you in court. <clears throat> so all of this to me seems to revolve around two conflicting visions of sexual morality in this world. And when I teach my course on human sexuality, the Constitution, and the Church, I begin the course by requiring students to read a wonderful book by a brilliant philosopher, Love and Responsibility. That particular philosopher is Blessed John Paul. And in that book, he outlines God's vision of sexual morality. And then we go through the Supreme Court cases and we try to figure out what the anthropology of the American political body is according to the Supreme Court. And then I ask the students, which is more attractive? And I'm going to ask you the same question when we get to that point. The church is teaching that seems to cause the most tumult and cry is humane vitae. And my students are always stunned when I stand before them in class and say, I believe humane vitae is right. To which they say, but you're a professional woman, professor. You're educated. How could you believe such, oh, you're just superstitious. <laughs> and then we go through the warnings of Pope Paul. It's a short document. And he's very clear. He warns us that if we reject an ethos of sexual self-restraint, which is really the foundation of the document, and substitute a chemical or some sort of medical device, what we will see is increased marital infidelity. He warns us that we will see a general lowering of moral standards. Anyone who's raised a young child knows that that certainly happened. He warned us that men will treat women as mere instruments for the satisfaction of their own desires. And I will tell you, as someone who has been in the university setting for over 18 years, I became a professor right out of kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> that it's no longer just men treating women as mere instruments, but women also treating men as mere instruments for the satisfaction of their own desires. Although there's a growing body of research that evidences it's a far less satisfactory, even tenable position for young women. There's a wonderful new book out called Adam and Eve and the Pill, and I recommend it to you. And it documents the great harm to our young women from this idea that we can play with sex to get love. It doesn't work out very well. And then finally, he warns us that public authorities will intervene in the most personal and intimate responsibilities of husband and wife. And we certainly see that. So, where does that take us? Well, it takes us to these two competing visions of the good. Here's the modern vision that's promoted through things like the HHS regulations, uh, the mandate, and the, the funding we do of various entities. Sex education starts in kindergarten, 
both the Minnesota Department of Education as well as the U.S. Department of Education recommend reliance on guidelines produced by an organization called SECUS, the Sex Information and Education Council of the United States. If you look at those guidelines, that introduction, even at kindergarten, is about how sex is all about physical pleasure, and pleasuring yourself is part of the education. Nowhere until you get to late high school do you see any reference to self-restraint, to focusing on the good, not using someone, but sharing love with someone. So sex education begins in kindergarten. And at age 11 for our daughters, well, you're supposed to take them down to the friendly physician and get a Gargacel HPV vaccine. Now I understand with physicians in the room how controversial this is because cervical cancer is scary and it's serious. But the HPV virus is largely a product of an indiscriminate sexual life. And if we were teaching chastity instead of a lack of self-restraint and reliance on chemicals or medical or some sort of medical device, the incidence of it would be remarkably lower. So we send our 11-year-old daughters to have a discussion about why they need this shot. And it's because we know you're going to have, start having sex soon and we want to protect you against the physical consequences of that sort of decision. Sexual intercourse in this country, 6% of children have had sexual intercourse before age 13, 6%. The evidence is overwhelming that almost every one of those kids, it is a forced situation. It is involuntary and coerced. And almost a third of our children have had intercourse by the end of their ninth grade year in high school. Casual sex and cohabitation is considered typical. We see it through our media, and we see it through our public education programs. Cohabitation is expected. We've seen a 17-fold, that's time 17, from 1980 to the present, while Minnesota is now the fourth lowest marriage rate in the United States. And if that cohabitation and casual sex leads to the conception of an unborn child? Well, there's always abortion. And so it shouldn't inconvenience your progress, personally or professionally. The other great myth of this modern vision of a woman's life is that a woman can have a baby at any time. My law students come to me regularly and say, Professor, I want to get established in my practice. And there's this wonderful man, in fact, I had this conversation last week, who I'd been dating for two years, but then he went and bought a ring. And I didn't know what to say. And I said, well, do you want to spend the rest of your life with? Well, I want to finish my degree and become a partner first. Is he willing to wait? No. Sounds like you've got a decision. But you know, I went to law school and married with a child. You know, I did just fine in the firm, married with two children. And while I'm not the President of the United States, or even the President of Dorsey Whitney, I've got a pretty decent career. So maybe you ought to rethink whether these two are incompatible. Because the reality is women's fertility and ability to conceive a child decreases dramatically after age 28. So those young women who believe that they can have it all, but they've got to have the professional part first, and they can have a child any time, are often very sad when they learn that that's not true. In fact, the American Society for Reproductive Medicine was so concerned about this that they began a campaign, a billboard campaign in New York City, informing women that their fertility began to drastically decline starting at age 28. And that billboard was getting a lot of talk going among young professional women particularly until Planned Parenthood sued to have it taken down off of 
the public buses and out of the public square so that women wouldn't know that there were consequences to their choice to delay creating a child with the man they love. So, this is the contemporary vision. What does our church offer that could possibly compete with that? <laughs> well, <laughs> let's begin with a commitment that we want not only every child to be a wanted child, but we want every child to be protected in law regardless of whether they're wanted. So we want that child to be conceived through a marital act of love and self-giving between husband and wife and raised in the home of her married mother and father. The one arrangement that we know with certainty, regardless of all other arrangements that are available, has the greatest possibility of setting that child on the path to moral, physical, economic, and intellectual success. We want them during adolescence and early adulthood to learn to develop friendships with men and women based on trust and mutual respect, a sharing of their minds, of their hopes, of their dreams, before they share their bodies. We want every one of us to discern God's plan in our lives and commit to following it from the very beginning that we begin to think about what do you want to be when you grow up? And we want that commitment to culminate in a total gift of self in marriage or holy orders or a gift to the community that can be made through living a chaste single life. But we believe it is through giving that we receive, it is through that service to others that we manifest the love within us and the love that God has for us. And that total self-gift that is manifested through marriage or holy orders or the chaste single life <coughs> is always spiritually fruitful and often physically fruitful in the cause of marriage. So that's our vision versus shots and pills and, well, whatever. So the bishops are asking us, and you should be asking yourself, what are we going to do in this culture? What will we do? What will you commit tonight to do to restore the civilization of love and the culture of life? In making that commitment, understand that it may be costly. Martin Luther King Jr., in 1967, in a speech, made the following statement. On some positions, a coward asks the question, is it safe? Expediency asks the question, is it politic? Vanity asks the question, is it popular? But conscience ask the question, is it right? And there come a time when we must take a position that is not safe, nor politic, nor popular. But we must take it because conscience tells us it is right. Search your conscience. Form your conscience. And exercise your rights as American citizens, to demand recognition of the natural great gift of religious liberty. Thank you. Lisa, thanks very much. Uh, we do have some time for some questions, so anybody who would like to. Uh, raise, a, or raise a question, just raise your hand and we'll uh, get following. Sure. You mentioned the dilemma that University of St. Thomas and Lincoln, St. Joe's Hospital, so what are you hearing? What, 
Because if the law is upheld, we'll have to take that scenario. Then they go in, in the mandate, then they go in, and here in August, or something, you know, it's coming up. So what do you think people, what, what do you think these institutions are going to do? Are they going to pay the fine? Are they just going to say, bring lawsuits? I know there's also a lawsuit out there, but what, what do you foresee un, unfolding here, assuming the law is upheld? I would like to disconnect it from my uh, employer. Prudence is the great charioteer of all virtues. <laughs> and talk more generally, um, because there have been lawsuits filed by uh, Catholic universities and by Catholic hospitals, EWTN, and there is one in the Eighth Circuit, uh, which is our circuit, the courts that control us. Uh, the Diocese of St. Louis is a plaintiff in that case. So if on Thursday, which is the predicted date that the court will deliver its opinion on the Health Care Act. Uh, the court either A, sustains the act in its entirety, which seems highly unlikely in light of the oral argument and the briefing. When the Solicitor General has an anticipated fairly obvious questions, you know that things are not all well on that side of the case. Uh, or in the alternative, and this is what most experts are predicting, and I think it is the most likely outcome, although not the outcome I would desire. <coughs> they will strike down the individual mandate which requires us to pay or purchase insurance, but they will leave the rest of it intact, including, <coughs> including the requirement of free preventative health care services. So the mandate will stay. Then we will go through litigation. In litigation, they are making a broad number of claims. The first is that it violates the Administrative Procedures Act, which is a technical, geeky, lawyer thing, but if it works, we're happy, right? And that they didn't promulgate it, they didn't get enough conversation, they didn't do it the right way. Okay, fine. If they don't go that way, they argue that it violated a statute called the Restoration of Religious Freedom Act, RIFRA. RIFRA, in my opinion, is probably our best shot. It is a statute enacted by Congress that requires any infringement on religious belief at the federal level to be done only because of a compelling state interest and the way that they do it must be narrowly tailored. That's the legal test. I think if that is the test they apply, we will win. If they do not rule in our favor on RIFRA, that we move to the free exercise of religion provision. Unfortunately, that particular provision of the amendment uh, has been neutered by the courts. Justice Scalia, who I am usually a great fan of, in 1990 wrote an opinion known as Oregon v. Smith. And in that case, and it's one of those stories where bad facts make bad law, there were two drug enforcement officers in Oregon who, as part of their religious beliefs, smoked a small amount of peyote ritually. There is no evidence that they did it recreationally. There's no evidence it was in their homes. There's no evidence. It is as if someone who is a teetotaler goes to mass and takes the sacrament of both species. That's it. They were fired because they were drug enforcement officers. And they then claimed unemployment, and they were denied unemployment. On those facts, the case went up to the United States Supreme Court. And Justice Scalia, writing for a majority, said that as long as the law is valid and neutral, of generally applicable, it's generally applicable, then there is no free exercise problem. And to show you, to illustrate the perniciousness of that particular rule, Scalia gave this example. And the example was this. When prohibition was established, Congress reserved to itself the power to create certain exceptions to the prohibition on the sale and distribution of alcoholic beverages. And one of the few exceptions they created was on the sale and distribution of sacramental wine. That's actually how Christian brothers got their start. Okay, serving the church during this period. Scalia said in this 1990 opinion, if Congress chose not to have that exception and forbade the sale of all alcoholic beverages, including 
sacramental wine. That would be constitutional under the new test. Your notes, can you celebrate Eucharist without wine? No. So what Scalia is saying, it is it's possible constitutionally in this country to have a law that would essentially eliminate celebration of the Eucharist and it not be a free exercise problem. That's why Congress passed the Restoration of Religious Freedom Act, <laughs> all right? But if we don't win on that, then winning under this new constitutional standard will be very difficult. If that is the case, then what we are going to find, if we lose these lawsuits, what we are going to find is that employers are going to have to make a decision. Now, the USCCB has already told us what they're going to decide. They are going to not provide these services and or fund these services, and they are going to pay the fines, which will diminish our ability to do all of the good works that we are called to do by Matthew 25. These are not simply things that we do to be socially popular. These are things we do to obey God. Notwithstanding that, we will have to pay the fines and subject ourselves to that problem. Will private employers do it? Some will, some won't. Will all Catholic institutions do it? Some will, some won't. But at that point, we will be living in a, in a situation where many of us who are not people of heroic virtue, we are just ordinary Catholics who love the Lord, but being heroes isn't in our playbook, will find that it's not civil disobedience we're talking about, it's conscientious refusal. What's the difference? Civil disobedience is where you really do have heroic virtue. And you step up and you say, this law is unjust, so I'm going to violate it. And I'm going to accept my punishment. And when the public sees that they are literally imprisoning an 80-year-old bishop for praying the rosary 10 feet out of the side of an abortion clinic, they will recognize how unjust this law is. And their hearts will be moved and they will change the law. That's civil disobedience. That's when you voluntarily, that's Rosa Parks. That's when you voluntarily step up and as an act of patriotism and love of God, you accept punishment to illustrate to your fellow citizens how pernicious the law is. Most of us don't have that sort of moral virtue. But conscientious refusal is a different animal. Conscientious refusal is what we are called to as Christians when we live our lives in such a way to avoid ever being required to publicly affirm or disaffirm, but the choice comes to us. It's when that young physician for the very first time is told to stay in this clinical practice, they have to be willing prescribe the morning after pill. They didn't seek it out. They don't want to change any rules. They just want to live their life and be a good doc. But at that moment, we will have to decide. And it will have eternal consequences. Just uh, following up on that question, first of all, thanks for a, for a very Insightful presentation. Appreciate it very much. Following up on that, uh, uh, the end of your comments there. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the, the overturning of the Levitt policy doesn't have anything to do with the HHS uh, 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 mandate. I, to you are Levitt. correct on that. They are, however, done through the similar worldview and mindset about conscience. But that's going to still be an issue even if the HHS mandate were con completely overruled and while institutions may not be under threat, individual pharmacists, nurses, physicians, clerks uh, are still under uh, potentially tremendous threat and will have to make choices about their conscience versus their jobs in the coming decades. The question is a very important one and I'm going to repeat it since we're doing recording of this and I'm afraid it wasn't picked up. The, the conscience protection that I opened the conversation with, because to the extent that if, if I had looked out and 90% of you had raised your hands and said we're doctors, we, the, the second half would have been pretty quick and dirty, but we would have spent a lot of time on the conscience protection. Um, 
That is separate. It is a separate administrative action from the HHS mandate. And even if the Health Care Act is completely set aside as unconstitutional by the United States Supreme Court, this policy about conscience protection, this narrow, stingy policy that replaced the fulsome coverage that we had, will be in place until changed by either Congressional Act or by Administrative Act. Either the President could order a different policy to be put in place, a reinstitution of the Levitt policy, or they could craft a similarly fulsome protection. But you are quite correct. The two are disconnected as far as legal efficacy, but very connected as far as, far as worldview and understanding the role of religious belief in health care. <coughs> yes, ma'am. Would a Catholic hospital who won't do abortions now be required to do abortions? The question is, would a Catholic hospital that does not allow its facilities to be used for abortion currently be required to do abortions? And the answer to that depends not only on federal law, which is what we're talking about, but state law. So in 2008, I believe, it may be 2006, forgive me, because that's part of the reason I do slides, so that I have all the details right here in front of me. 2008, 2006, there was a case in the Alaska Supreme Court. Its name is Valley Hospital versus Matsu. And in this case, because Alaska is such an odd state, you can't even get to the capital without a plane. Okay? So it's a very odd geographic state. So there are very few hospitals and there are great distances to travel between hospitals in that state. An abortion provider wanted to provide abortions all the way up through the third trimester. But new regulations were enacted by the state legislature that required certain facilities to be available and certain medical equipment to be available in order in case something went wrong. But that would require remodeling her clinic and spending more money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, when there was this lovely community hospital right across the street. And this hospital was not a public hospital. It was owned by individual members of the community who came together and created this private hospital. But if you lived in the community, if you paid $25, you could join the association and be a part of the ownership of the hospital. Well, for a short period of time, they provided their facilities to the abortion provider. But then people began, as people are, to see the injustice inherent in abortion. And they decided to establish a new policy that they would not allow their surgical facilities to be used for abortions except where there was a threat to the mother's life. The abortion provider, because she was going to have to remodel her facility, sued in state court and said, I have a right to use the hospital facilities in order to perform my second and third trimester abortions. The Alaska Supreme Court said that under the state constitution of Alaska, which has a privacy provision, that notwithstanding that it was a private hospital, because it had taken a donation of land to expand its parking lot once, it became a quasi-public hospital and therefore must open its doors to the abortion provider. In a footnote to this opinion, coming to our Catholic hospitals, the court said, although the hospital before us is not religiously affiliated, it is our opinion that the reasoning would be identical. Cardinal O'Connor, who in my humble opinion should be blessed, Cardinal O'Connor, <laughs> Cardinal O'Connor was quoted in the New York Times as saying, we will shut them down first. Now, I adore Cardinal O'Connor, but sometimes he was a bit of a hothead. <laughs> Think about the reality of that. Hospitals in Alaska may be two and three hundred miles apart. And the next time little Jimmy has appendicitis and it's hot and we need it tended to now, surgically, we really don't want to be forced 
to give up our care of little Jimmy. And so while it may come to that, first, if I were advising the Cardinal, we would have a flash mob ready. And the first time an abortion was scheduled, that flash mob, led by the Cardinal, would be in the hallways to the surgical suites, and dang it, you just can't get through. I just don't know how we're going to deal with it. <laughs> Sorry. And we would wait to see if the police were going to join the flash mob or were going to carry the cardinal out by his hands and his feet. And I'd be there with him, but I'd wear pants that day. <laughs> so it seems to me that surrendering health care to secular authorities who think that a pill and surgery solves all the moral problems of the world is not what we're called to do. We've been in the healthcare business well, since Moses, and certainly since Christ. And we are not going to surrender that territory to the government that we control. Um, excuse my lack of medical. Yes. yes. Excuse my lack of medical knowledge. I thought the Hippocratic Oath was do no harm. Where, where did the one that you presented come from, and what's the distinction there? That is the first clause in do no harm. Oh, okay. And then it continues to include these specific instances that were highly controversial at the time it was promulgated. Okay, so it's more extensive than just the one phrase. It is indeed. Thank you. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Will excuse in the debate. In, in other words, uh, she will not take part in the decision. No, we already know that Justice Kagan has refused to recuse. Oh, she refused to refuse. Yes. 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 So she will be part of the decision. Yes, she will be part of the decision. Even though she will be the below. She will be part of the decision. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Do you know um, if the HHS mandate stands? Will it override or nullify the conscience clauses in private institutions such as the Mayo Clinic? I'm having difficulty hearing you, yeah. but if you have a private hospital. Right. If Mayo Clinic has a conscience clause for its employees. If the HHS mandate stands, will it nullify the conscience clause of the Mayo Clinic? No. That's an excellent question. If the mandate stands and if the regulation that is so tiny stays in place. Will that nullify the private contractual agreement that Mayo has entered into with the healthcare providers that provide services to them? And that's a really important point. The answer to that is no, and why is it no? If the Supreme Court comes down on Thursday, as we do not expect, but they say, we think the Health Care Act is just perfect. We couldn't have devised a better system if we'd been asked to, right? If they say that, all they mean is it's constitutional. They don't mean it's mandatory. And so a new Congress could come back and say, well, with all due respect, Your Honors, we think it's terrible, and we're repealing it today. So it's not, when something's determined to be constitutional, it does not mean it's required. It simply means that the courts aren't going to nullify it. In a similar way, the contract provision is a private agreement. We are free to assume more duties than the Constitution requires. Mayo, as a private actor, is free to enter into an agreement that they will not do that. It's a private agreement, and it would be enforced through contractual litigation. Yes, sir? What? Um what is the, the current administration's um, private, as best as you can guess, take on the fortnight for freedom and the whole question of religious liberty and its conscience reforms? Based on every piece of letter, uh, email I've sent in, and in response to that, they're basically saying that if, if they respond, it's basically, uh, thanks for your comment, you know, we'll, um, we'll file it away. The question is, what does my crystal ball tell me about the current administration's reaction, response, ultimate evaluation of the Fortnight for Freedom and the efforts that the churches and many concerned secular citizens are making to protest this overreaching by our government? Uh, let me first begin, and something perhaps we should have began 
saying it from the very beginning. Uh, this concern crosses party aisle, the party aisle, all right? This is not, and that's why I've been very careful to, to not specifically talk about it as Obamacare or to speak of the president himself except as to his speech because nobody else gave the speech. Uh, but there, regardless of party affiliation, there are members of both parties that have that sort of government vision that we want absolute license and free availability of pills and procedures to avoid the consequences of that sort of absolute license, all right? But having said that, this particular point in time, we certainly see an aggressiveness in promoting that vision that we have not seen historically. We've been able to hold it at bay. We've been able to, if you will, keep the libertines at bay, regardless of which party they came from, uh, or no party. In this instance, however, I think some of them are true believers. Some of them honestly believe that women's happiness and their ability to participate in the life of the community is dependent upon contraception and abortion. One of my great disappointments in Justice O'Connor is in the Casey plurality opinion, which is the controlling opinion, she writes that contraception has allowed women to participate fully in the economic and political life of this country. Now, in fact, um, I have done research on women's progress prior to that opinion in 1973, and we see women governors. Texas actually had an all-woman Supreme Court for a brief time in the 19s. It was because all the men were members of the country club that was being sued. But that was. <laughs> they had an all-woman female court. So this meant that women have to sacrifice their fertility and their children on the altar of the economy and on the altar of participation in the world is exactly that. It's a myth. But it is egregiously perpetuated. And there are a number of people in leadership who believe it wholeheartedly. And so the fortnight will mean nothing to them. We are just misguided or Neanderthals. Take your pick. There are others for whom raw political power means something. And as citizens, we have every right to exercise our vote and to demand accountability. Uh, Chintisimu Sanis has a very clear passage from Blessed, Blessed John Paul about authentic democracy requires the correct conception of the human person. And to live in a country that this January, for 40 years, will have called a corporation a person with constitutional rights, but that unborn baby at eight months is not a person, is not the correct concept of the human person. And we can do something about it. So vote this November. Yes, yes sir. Uh, from your crystal ball, what do you think <laughs> if, uh, whether the new administration possibly uh, which will come, let's say that uh, this administration does, is not anymore there. Would they, uh, this Levitt uh, uh, policy, would they be uphold? Uh, my best guess uh, is based on the fact that Marianne Glendon, who some of you may know, a brilliant Harvard law professor. Uh, when I was a young lawyer, I used to say, when I grow up, I want to be Marianne Glendon. Uh, she was actually the ambassador to the Vatican. She's brilliant. Uh, she is advising uh, the Romney uh, campaign. And so he has surrounded himself with people like Robert George, Marianne Glendon, some very smart Catholics, so I would be very optimistic. Again, but this administration could, could change their hearts. Prayer is number one. Prayer is number one. All right? So pray for our president. Pray for our president. Pray for Secretary Sebelius, because as a, as a person who holds herself as a Catholic, she needs God's grace to enter into her life more fully. So, yes. Do we have time for a couple more? I saw one more hand, I thought. We'll do another five minutes. Yes, Father. Uh, what would happen if the Catholic organization decided to not follow the mandate and then didn't get funds? What would happen if the Catholic organization decided not to follow the mandate and then did not pay the fines that were levied? Corporate officers would be thrown in jail. Yes. 
It's very simple. Yes, sir. I am lay to both the church and to the medical, and four months from now is election time. So what we're doing right now, looking at it from where I'm at, where do we, as way down doing the voting thing, where do we come into this and what do we do? I think that that's, it was a mistake made four years ago. I think we can fix that. I think we need everybody to get off our dust and go do it. Well, you, the question is what concrete action items can you recommend to us? Number one, I brought some flyers because the USCCB is asking you if you're a tech savvy and even grandmas like me who come into the texting world to keep up with kids and and, well, the grandkids are only two and four months, so they're not texting yet. <laughs> but, um, but you can text, and the USCCB will be sending you messages and alerting you as things happen. So, number one, uh, if you're a text person, text and join the campaign. If you're not, the USCCB has finally come into the 21st century, and they have a beautiful web page that is on the USCCB directed to religious liberty. All of that. There's a, there are wonderful homilies on there, there are wonderful speeches on there, and there are action items. Sign up with the Minnesota Catholic Conference Internet Network, and they will send you email alerts about things you can do. Bills that came up in the, past, in the legislature this past year at the state level included things like abortion clinic regs. And we, couldn't, we got it passed, but the governor vetoed it they will send you email alerts. So inform yourself, pray, then inform yourself, and then, I was mad enough when the Stupec Amendment was defeated last year, last time with my congressional representative who sent me a letter telling me how proud she was that she uh, was writing reproductive rights into the law, that I decided to run for Congress. Uh, <laughs> Well, no. no, 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 this was a really foolish thing, but, but I learned a ton, and the other thing I learned is ultimately votes count, but dollars help you get those votes out, because if, if there's a sort of radio silence on candidates who support our view, then they can't get their message out, and I, I know from personal experience that for 20 grand, all we could do was cable television advertising. So find the candidate you believe in, support them with your, first with prayer, financially, but, but we've got to have a united voice and it's got to be a, we need a reform. Pray for revival, work for revival, and God bless America, God bless